Well, good evening. Good evening. I appreciate that. It's so good to be with you all, and it's always a joy to be able to open the Word of God together. I invite you to go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the, uh, the last message in our series on giving, investing, and eternity. We've talked about why, talk about money, we've talked about how to give, we talked about funding the Great Commission, and tonight I want to talk about barriers to giving, barriers to giving. I'm going to go ahead and ask the Lord to help us by opening in prayer, and uh, we'll look at 1 Timothy in just a few moments. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's ask the Lord's help. Father, there's uh, many concerns in our minds, many things happening, plans being made for Christmas and uh, joyous occasions to celebrate for sure. And yet you have us here tonight, and you providentially plan for us to be hearing a message about giving. Because there's something you want to say to us today here and to our church as a whole, as many listen later via the podcast. I pray, God, that you would do a great work of generosity in our hearts, that we would reflect on the generosity shown to us in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of hearts that have been transformed, giving would not be a chore, but be a delight and be a joy for us to participate in. I pray, Father, you would help us even as we examine tonight some barriers to giving that we might encounter so that our hearts would be moved to want to give, to invest in eternity. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his help in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, there is a, uh, a new sickness going around, and it is affecting homes all over the place, all over America especially. It's probably not what you're thinking about. It's not the flu. It's not a virus, although some have called it an epidemic. Some have even called it a plague. It was popularized a few years back in a PBS documentary, and they labeled this disease affluenza, the disease of affluence. Most of us just simply call it materialism. Or if we want to use some biblical categories, good old-fashioned greed. Or the desire for riches. We have a possession obsession. We just want more stuff. And the same PBS documentary claims in it uh, the results of this affluenza are pretty stark. They say that the average American shops six hours a week while only spending about 40 minutes in that same week with their children. And by age 20, most Americans have seen over a million commercials, advertisements. More Americans, they claim, have claimed bankruptcy than have graduated from college. And by some statistics, uh, somewhere around 90% of people who have been divorced cite as one of the prominent reasons arguments about money. Arguments about money. Well, in this last sermon on giving in this series, I want to address three barriers to giving. There's a lot more we could address. These are just ones that um, have come to my mind by feedback you've given me or things that we haven't addressed yet in the series. And these three might not all equally apply to all of you, and that's okay. But I do want to address all three, but probably spend a little more time on the first one because I think it's a foundational barrier that's undergirding the rest. And I think it's, all, it's one that we all struggle with at times. And it's what I just introduced in talking about this affluenza, this materialism, this greed. I think we all struggle with a lack of contentment. A lack of contentment. One of the main reasons we don't give is because we believe that we need that same money to buy more stuff. There's always more things that we want. There's always more things that we don't have. And the reason we want more is because we believe it's going to make us happy. The reality is, it's not going to make us happy. And just to illustrate that, here's some statements from some of the wealthiest people that have ever lived and what they said about how riches didn't make them happy. Listen to this. John D. Rockefeller said that I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Andrew Carnegie said, millionaires seldom smile. Hmm, isn't that interesting? John Jacob Astor said, I am the most miserable man on earth. Henry Ford said, I was happier 
when doing a mechanic's job. These are some of the richest guys, the wealthiest men who have ever lived. Why aren't they happy? If money is supposed to make you happy, why aren't they happy? You see, when you get more stuff, it just means you have more to manage and more to worry about and more to take care of. Think about it. If you buy a, an RV or a boat or a vacation house, well, then you have to justify owning it by using it, which in many cases might mean more frequent trips and time away from either family or church, making you unavailable to serve at church and to be in the nursery or to be in Sunday school or to help in the uh, guest services or whatever because you're busy using your stuff. Now, I, I know many faithful Christians that have those things, and instead of using them to take them away from their church family, they use it to spend time with their church family and to bless them, and I'm so thankful for them. I'm not critiquing that. But I just want you to think about the encumbrances of just stuff. Just stuff. I mean, a bigger house means more money in furniture and on utilities and a bigger mortgage, and therefore you have less to give. Or one new thing leads to more. So you buy a brand new HD TV. Well, Shoot, now you got this big TV, you got to use it. So maybe you buy a more expensive cable package with more premium channels and HD. Oh, and then you got to get it, you got to upgrade your sound system, of course, too. And then you got to get a new recliner to sit in because you're just watching more TV. One thing just leads to another and another and another. Stuff just leads to more stuff. <laughs> and it all costs money. It all costs money. And it takes time and attention and energy away from other things. And don't misunderstand me. The problem is not a boat or a TV or an RV or any of those things. The problem is me. The problem is you. The problem is our own sinful heart and what we want and what we're content with. But this tyranny of things that just plague us, that we have to have. But the reality is all this stuff and none of it we can take with us. This might be a little discouraging to some of you, but think of all the Christmas presents you just spent all this money on and all this time acquiring. The reality is, you don't have to wait until you die. In probably a couple years, they're going to end up in the trash heap or unused. That's just the reality. I look at presents I bought my kids, and I'm like, you don't play with that anymore? I just spent all that money on that thing, and we spent hours putting it together, and it's just sitting there. I hope it'll bless someone else. It's just... Stuff requires a lot of us. We want to be spending our time and energy and our money on what will last for eternity. We want to be investing in eternity. And here in 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Timothy 6, it gives us an antidote to this affluenza. Look at the first couple of verses here uh, in verse 6, 7, and 8. 1 Timothy 6, 7, and 8. It says, But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. It's gain. You're gaining something when it's accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Remember Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped the page. <laughs> that makes sense. There we go. For, for uh, It continues in verse 8. For we have found, for we have food and covering. With these we shall be content. With these, we shall be content. We, we have to just learn to be content with less. We, we don't always uh, need new clothes, the latest fashions, or the newest iPhone, or a fancy car, or a bigger house, or extravagant vacation. We don't need that stuff. Sure, it's nice. Sure, we'd like to have it. Of course you want that in many cases. But we don't need it. We learn to be content with less. Pilgrims travel light. Don't spend money. Picture this. Imagine you, you, you bought a home in a foreign country, and you're buying furniture because there's none in, this, uh, in that house, and on the way there, you have to stop at a hotel. You've got to stay there for a couple days while you're traveling. You're, you're not going to have all the things you're buying for your new home in another country and fix up the hotel. Because you're not going to live there permanently. You're just passing by. That's what our home is here. We're just pilgrims passing by. So don't spend so much money fixing up your hotel room. Put it in the final home where you're going to live for all eternity. 
That's what it means to invest in eternity and being content with less now because you're stockpiling for eternity. And, and there's a real danger this passage warns us about when we lose our eternal perspective. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The best way to fight against the love for money is to give it away and invest in eternity. You can't love something that you're constantly giving away. And then he addresses the rich. Look at, second, uh, look at verses uh, 17, 18, and 19. He goes on, he says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited and or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us of all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Now, some of you hear that and you're like, okay, he's talking about the rich, that's not me. <laughs> I know that. Well, we have to put things in perspective. Here's the reality. Everybody in this room, everybody in this room is in the top 10% of the richest people who have ever lived on this planet. Everyone in this room is considered absolutely rich and wealthy by the world standards and by history standards. We are so affluent compared to our brothers and sisters in Christ and the rest of humanity who's ever lived. We are among the people that are addressed in this passage when he talks about the rich. All of us are. And what does he say to that? He says, God adequately supplies all your material needs, and he not just adequately supplies your material needs, he abundantly supplies all of your spiritual needs. All of your spiritual needs. The antidote to materialism is contentment, and what we need most to be content with is focusing on what we've been given. And what we've most been given, the richest thing we've been given, is in Christ. Think about what God has given us in the person of Jesus Christ. He looked upon our sorry state. He saw our desperate need, stuck in sin and mire and destined to hell. And he could have left us there and given us nothing. He didn't owe us anything. But he gave us everything. He gave us himself in the person of Jesus Christ, who came, was born in that manger, lived a perfect righteous life, keeping the law without flaw, died on a Roman cross by way of execution, not for sins he committed, but for our sins, paying for them on the cross, fully absorbing the wrath of God, and rising from the dead, and ascending to the right hand of the Father, and offers us the free gift of life for all eternity, for anyone who repented of their sins and trust in Christ. That's what God has given us. And by accepting that free gift and receiving it by faith in Jesus Christ, he's given us salvation. He's given us forgiveness. He's given us redemption. He's given us adoption. He's given us the seal of the Spirit. He's given us assurance. He's given us eternal life. He's given us all these blessings lavishly upon us in Jesus Christ. How could you want anything else? When you think about what's been given to you, your heart is overflowed with love and joy and contentment. Because you have everything you need for the rest of your life, the rest of your eternal life. What a wonderful gift God's given us. When we have that perspective, we can't help but be content and thankful and not worry about this stuff here. It doesn't last anyway. Stuff is not the problem by itself. It's our lack of contentment. But by resting and rejoicing in Jesus Christ and by intentionally limiting how much stuff we accumulate when we're passing by in the hotel, we can joyfully invest in eternity. Giving is the grace that loosens our heart's grip on greed so that we can love the things of the Lord all the more. Lack of contentment is a huge barrier for many. And giving is the antidote. 
and being content with what he's given us. Well, that's the first barrier, and I think foundational and at some level applicable to all of us, because I feel it too. But here's two more I want to talk about with you this evening. Uh, Some people have expressed, well, you know, I'm just, another barrier to giving is I'm just unsure how it's going to be used. Well, I honestly, I really appreciate that concern because what it demonstrates is the desire to be a good steward, which the Bible absolutely wants us to be a good steward. It's all his money anyway. We're just stewards of it, so we want to steward it well. And the Bible does command us to give. So in obedience to that command, we want to give to worthy causes. And what I want you to firmly have in your mind is that the worthy cause that you're paramount amount of giving should go to and concern should be is this local church it's first baptist church it's your family your faith family and the mechanism that you are being trained in and sent out by to reach the city with the gospel and you can to help alleviate this concern it might be just be helpful to understand how we as a church are trying to steward your giving all of our giving So here's some things uh, that some of you know or maybe don't all know, but uh, of course there's an annual budget that's voted on by all the members. So our whole collective body has to vote on this and approve it. And in addition to that, there is a monthly oversight of all the budgetary of the whole budget by the trustees that are members, they're deacons that have been voted on by the church and appointed for that responsibility. There is a monthly financial statements given to the church so the church can see these monthly financial statements. There is an annual independent audit done um, by an outside group to make sure we're following uh, appropriate standards and not misappropriating funds and they're being cared for well. And then we have receipts that are accounted for weekly by a member-led committee, uh, by members of this church that are keeping track of all that and making sure it's being stewarded well. And and I just want to say as well that there is, if anything, a, a renewed commitment at our church and among the pastoral leadership, to live within our means, to be more frugal, to only spend what we have to, and only spend what we have. And it's incredible. Uh, You know, I get to serve in a rotation of pastors to teach our new members class, and I love asking new members, hey, so what made you excited about joining this church? And over the last few months, it's been really exciting to see how people say, you know what? I saw the announcement on September 8th about the new generation of miracles, and I was excited about that, and I want to be part of that. Praise the Lord. That didn't scare you away? No. It made us excited about being part of this church, a church that's serious about reaching Jacksonville, a church that's serious about reducing our overhead to streamline our expenses so that we can invest as much energy as possible into reaching the city of the gospel. And if that means shedding some facilities that we can't afford anyway, then we're excited about that. Praise the Lord. They're excited about joining this church for that reason. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. There's there's a bold vision that our church has. We want to reach this city of the gospel. And that's not going to happen without stewarding our resources well and being committed as a church, not just to open our mouths and give uh, and to serve uh, and to speak the gospel, but to open our wallets and to give to fund this great commission work. So I just want to say that it is our desire and the whole church's desire that you're a part of to steward this resource well and to have confidence that this church is managing the money well and appropriating as much as possible for the purpose of fulfilling the Great Commission, of speaking the gospel, because that's what we're called to. If our church isn't doing that, then we don't, we don't, we shouldn't exist if we're not about fulfilling the Great Commission. That's why we're here and that's what we're about. So that's another barrier that some have to giving. Lastly, I'll address one more barrier that some people have expressed in terms of giving. And that is that they plan to give more later. And so this is really about expressing a barrier to giving now because they plan on giving more later. And again, I really appreciate this because it shows a willingness and desire to give. And that is a great blessing to our church. And usually it's expressed by something like this. Here's what it sounds like. Hey, you know, if it's a question, it says, well, should I give now or should I uh, wait a year or two and hold on to my investments hoping they'll do well and then I'll have even more to give later in a year or two or so? Well, 
That's a fair question. It's a good question. I appreciate the heart behind that. And here's, here's I think, how I'd want to respond if that's a question you're posing in your own mind. I'd say, first of all, well, how soon do you want to experience God's blessing? Do you want to receive that blessing now, or do you just want to wait to receive it later? Because he offers it now, and when you give now. And I'd also want to say, do you want to be sure that that money goes to God's kingdom, or do you want to risk that maybe it won't go to his kingdom? Well, you might say, well, hey, you know, uh, that's okay because um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm planning on um, uh, giving in my will. I'm like, okay, well, that's great too. But I'd say a couple of things to that. First of all, I, I don't think that when we stand before God, I don't think that he'll say, um, you know, you kind of blew it because you didn't wait for the stock market to peak before you gave. I don't think God's thinking in those categories. I think he could do whatever he wants with the money as soon as he gets it. And here's the reality. If we don't give now, we run some real risks. Think about it. We, we risk that the economy could change. And we actually have less money to give, not more. Only God knows the future. There's been financial uh, advisors that are absolutely sure what's going to happen. And they're wrong in many cases. So we just don't know. And the reality is the same heart that is prompting you to give now might be the same heart that prompts you not to want to give later. So while you're prompted to give, act on that in obedience and in faith. And the reality is your life may end before you know, before you intend to give. And even if you're like, well, I'm going to give in my will, that's great. We, we really appreciate that. Uh, legacy giving is so very helpful for the church. What a, what a great use of your funds after your death that rather than, there's lots of worthy causes, there's things like the Red Cross, and there's things like the Humane Society, and all these things. That's great. But if you give that money here instead, you can guarantee that this church is going to invest it in the kingdom and in the Great Commission. But even then, even then, think about this. It doesn't take a lot of trust to part of your money when you die. Because you don't have any choice then. And as Randy Alcorn says, death isn't your best opportunity to give. It's the end of your opportunity to give. God rewards acts of faith done while we're still living. And on top of all that, that's still assuming you're going to die. Don't we believe that Jesus could return at any moment? Don't we want to be ready for his return? Are we Christians that believe that Jesus is coming back and we're preparing for that return? I'm not waiting for death. I'm just getting ready because I want to be ready before he comes back. So think about it. When Jesus comes back, when he returns, what's going to happen to all the money that's sitting in bank accounts and retirement programs and estates and foundations? What's going to happen to all that? It's going to burn like wood and hay and straw when it could have been given in exchange for heavenly currency. It could have been an internal investment now. It could have been fulfilling the Great Commission right now. Because once Jesus comes back, eternity set. There's no one else getting in. It's right now we want the gospel to go forward. And that requires funds. We want to be about the business of stockpiling souls for heaven. And the only time we know we definitely have is right now. John Wesley said that um, money never stays with me. It would burn me if it did. I throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, lest it should find a way into my heart. For many of us, myself included, money has found a way into our heart. It's weaseled its way in there. And it's kind of lodged in there. And it's kind of stuck. And we think it's more important than it really is. But it's not. Because it's all going to burn up too. It's not going to last. We want to give it away so it can be used for God's purposes. The bottom line is that God wants you to be a cheerful giver. Not to just give out of duty. Not to just give because it's commanded. You should do that. But he wants you to be a cheerful giver. You should give because you want to move your heart to love what God loves. You want to move your heart to care more about lost souls who are headed to hell. You want to move your heart to resist the lure of materialism and greed. 
You want to give to move your heart to care about Christ's kingdom more than your kingdom. That's why we give. And in order to move your heart, you have to move your money out of your hands and into God's hands. It's all his anyway. He just lets us use it just to provide some food and shelter here. That's ultimately from him anyway. And in closing here, I I just want to end this series where I began four messages ago. That our, our church is a very generous and giving church. And I don't want anything I've said during these four series to, f- to take away from that or to at all feel like a rebuke. If the Lord's doing a work in your own heart, that's between you and the Lord. We just want to open up the Bible and let it speak. But I've been so encouraged over the last few four weeks by so many of you that have come up to me and just told me about how the Lord has done a good work in your heart. And you've seen over and over again the Lord's blessing in your life as you've learned the grace of joyful giving. And you are indeed a joyful giver. You look forward to it and you plan for it. And you're blessed by that. And you're so happy you've told me that we're doing a series on giving because you want other people in our church to know that joy the same way that you found it. And that is a real blessing. That's a real encouragement to all of us. And at the same time, our church has been marked by faithfulness here. We want to excel still more. We have new members. And we have a new generation that not only needs to bear the serving needs, We have a new generation that also needs to bear the financial burden of our church. The only way we're going to reach the gospel, uh, spread the gospel out by reaching Jacksonville, is by people who are committed to funding the Great Commission and stockpiling souls in heaven. And that's what giving allows us to do. Let's thank the Lord and ask him to help us to be cheerful givers and to love what he loves most of all. Let's pray. Oh, Father, your word comes and it just uh, upends all of what we think and feel. I know for me it's just a smack across the face and it's a reminder and it's a perspective that I need. I get caught down in the trenches of everyday needs and financial burdens and I lose perspective. I pray, Father, for all of us, for our people here, for our church as a whole, that we would understand what's at stake here, that we'd be more concerned about investing in eternity and investing in this passing hotel that we're staying in right now. I'm so thankful, Father, that you have given us every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. May that be the source of our contentment and the fuel that allows us to give what we can't keep anyway, to gain what we can never lose in eternity with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.